All right, well, a couple weeks ago, uh, if you were paying attention to the news, you saw that there was this uh, mega millions uh, jackpot of $1.6 billion. $1.6 billion. And then, as I understand it, the one who won that would have gotten, or did get, 700 and some million. So apparently the government gets more than the person who wins, but nonetheless, doesn't really matter. 700 and some million dollars. And people were continuously talking about what they would do with 700 and some million dollars. How generous they would be and how loving they would be and, and what they would try to accomplish, the good they would accomplish in this world. There's something interesting about dreaming about what you could do if you had such resources. So let's pretend for just a moment that your banker phoned you uh, Friday night. And they said, hey, I've got good news for you. An anonymous donor who loves you very much has decided to deposit in your account every single day 86,400 pennies which would be $864 every single day, seven days a week, for 365 days a year. But after the banker told you this, he went ahead and said, but there is one stipulation, you must spend all that money each and every day. No balance would be carried over from one day to the next. Every evening, the bank must cancel whatever sum you failed to use that day. So with a big smile, you thank your banker and you hang up and you start making your plans how you're going to spend that money. You start figuring up on a, on a pad of paper, well, that's about $6,000 a week. It'll, it'll equal about almost $315,000 a year. I'm going to spend that like nobody's business. But remember, remember, whatever you don't spend, you forfeit. Well, let's stop pretending for just a moment. Because every single morning, someone who loves you very much has de deposited in your bank, your bank of time, 86,400 seconds. 86,400 seconds. Every single one of us, every single day, has 86,400 seconds, which represents 1,440 minutes, and you've already figured out, 24 hours each day. Now you've got to remember, the same stipulation applies to the time that applied to the money. Whatever amount you don't use that day is just essentially forfeited, or whatever amount you don't use wisely. Nothing is carried over. Each day it starts new. There is no such thing as a 26-hour day, like although some of us might like to have such a thing, but like life is like a coin. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it once. You can only spend it once. Will Williman shares a story about early in his ministry. He says this, he says, Early in my ministry, I served a little church in rural Georgia. One Saturday, we went to a funeral in a little country church that was not of my denomination. I grew up in a big downtown church. I had never been to, been to a funeral like this one. The casket was open, the, and the funeral consisted of a sermon by the preacher. He said the preacher pounded on the pulpit and looked over at the casket and he said, it's too late for Joe. It's too late for Joe. He might have wanted to get more out of this life, but it's too late for Joe. He might have wanted to spend more time with his family. He might have wanted to do more things that would be good in this world, but he is dead now. It is too late for him. But it is not too late for you. There is still time for you. You can decide. You are still alive. It is not too late for you. Today is the day of decision. Will went on, he said, and then the preacher said, he told the, the, the people that were there, he said, about an experience he had heard of where a Greyhound bus had run into a funeral procession uh, that was on its way to the cemetery. And then he said, and that could happen to you today. You should decide today. Today is the day to get your life together. It's too late for old Joe, but it's not too late for you. I was so angry 
at that preacher, he said. On the way home, I told my wife, have you ever seen anything as manipulative and insensitive to that poor family? I found it disgusting. And she said, I've never heard anything like it. It was manipulative. It was disgusting. It was insensitive. And worst of all, it was true. <laughs> it was true. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, it says, Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. Making the most of the time, Paul says. Every moment, every second, every opportunity, use them to their fullest potential. That can be a daunting task to use every moment, every opportunity, every second, every minute wisely to, to pull out of it its full potential. Preacher, teacher, and writer Dallas Willard, when nearing the end of his life, was asked if he regretted anything. And he answered, he regretted wasting so much time. Now people who knew Dallas Willard said that he probably didn't even know what a television looked like. He spent all of his time teaching and reading and ministering. But even with all that he did, he still desired to make the most out of every opportunity to spend each moment getting closer to God than the one before. So today, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4. So if, you're, if you have your Bible, you can head that direction. I'm going to be reading now the New Living Translation. And as we look at this chapter, this chapter is essentially challenging us to spend our time wisely. To use each moment to get closer and closer and closer to God. And so how do we do that? Well, do we throw away our TVs and our tablets and our smartphones and our computers? Well, maybe. Maybe. But maybe we ought to listen to the important lessons that Peter gives us in this chapter 4. So I'm going to read to you the first six verses. This is what it says. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourself with the same attitude He had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties and their terrible worship of idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do, so they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. That is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the Spirit. As we start this chapter off, Peter says you need to be able to break free from your past. You need to be able to, to break the bonds of slavery of the past. He's reminding us as Christians that we have been freed. Freed from what we've done in the past. The desires of the past. The peer pressure that comes with the past should be replaced. It should be replaced with this desperate desire to come and know God to please Him and love Him, regardless of whether it requires suffering or whether people slander us. Peter says you should be doing what is right and distancing yourself from all those things you did in your past. Too often Christians haven't broken away from their past like they should. So often as Christians, we want to kind of be in the church on Sunday morning, maybe Sunday evening, possibly Wednesday. But the rest of the time, we, we kind of want to try to dip our toe back into the sin we love so much. We, we kind of want to play around 
on the outskirts of the sinful behavior that we were supposed to have given up. And we keep reminding ourselves, well, God will forgive me. Well, God will forgive me. Well, God will forgive me. But Peter says you need to break free from that. You need to distance yourself from that. You need to remove yourself from that. On the flip side of the coin, some Christians desperate to live for the Lord are also chained to the past. But instead of chained to their desires to do evil, they're chained to the guilt of what they did that was evil. So they're constantly being pulled down by the weight of guilt that they carry themselves rather than breaking free from it and leaving it in the hands of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11, through 11, it says this, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. But then Paul says, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. He says, some of you did participate in those things, but you have been cleansed. You've been sanctified. You've been transformed. You've been changed by the blood of Christ. By calling on Jesus' name and living in obedience to Him. Life is far too short to be shackled to guilt. And it is far too short to live for the temporary pleasures of this life. And Peter is calling for us to break free from the old life along with all the, the terrible thinking that goes along with it. Maybe you watched the movie, A Beautiful Mind. A, a Beautiful Mind traces the life of a genius mathematician and the Nobel Prize winner, John Forbes Nash Jr. Now, John Forbes Nash Jr. was, was tormented by paranoid schizophrenia. Nash was a genius mathematician studying at Princeton, seeking to discover a truly original idea. He explained his concept of equilibrium in his 1950 dissertation called Non-Cooperative Games, which eventually earned him the 1994 Nobel Prize in Economics. But long before that, while a student at Princeton, Nash began to experience paranoid schizophrenia. Several delusions, delusional characters left him unable to discern reality from hallucination. And he was eventually institutionalized, and after shock treatment and many medicines, he was left unable to think math problems through and unable to care for his young son or his wife. And so he determined to get off the medications and to reason his way through this severe mental illness. So in 1994, Thomas King from the Nobel Committee met with Nash to assess his mental state and determine if he would be suitable as a Nobel laureate. In their conversation, Nash, Nash says to King, tongue-in-cheek, I am crazy. Then more soberly, he says this, and I want you to listen to what he says. I take the newer medications, but I still feel, see things that are not here. I just choose not to acknowledge them. Like a diet of the mind, I just choose not to indulge certain appetites. Here's what I want you to understand. Peter is calling for you and me to have this, this diet of the mind where we choose to ignore the guilt of the things that we have already repented for, where we choose to let go of those things, even though Satan keeps pushing them back in our mind, we ignore them, and where we abstain from the appetites that spring from our own desires. Peter is calling on us to unshackle ourselves from the past. 
Now he tells us right up front, it's going to be hard. It's going to come with suffering. But it's worth it. Peter starts off, he says, unshackle yourself from the past. If you want to live redeeming the time in your life, you need to unshackle yourself from the past. But he goes on, starting in verse 7, he says, the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from His great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God Himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to Him forever and ever. Amen. Peter started off by telling us break free from the past, but as you continue on, you realize that he's saying to us, you better get busy in the present. That's what he says. You better get busy in the present. He essentially shifts gears. He says, stop looking back and get busy now. He says, get busy now. By the way, there is a truth here that we often overlook, and that is this. Getting busy right now is one of the best ways to stop looking back. If you want to stop being shackled to your past, start doing what God has called you to do right now. And you won't have time to be worried about the past. In fact, Peter says you need to be constantly involved in prayer. You need to be loving your brothers and sisters. You need to be sharing your life and resources. You need to be using God, your God-given gift. If you do those things, you have little time to worry about what is behind you because you'll be focused on the right now. We need to get busy. We need to get busy in the present. We need to get busy in this moment. This is a call to remember whose you are and what you've been called to do. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says this, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. As a Christian, we have got to grab hold of the idea, the realization that this life is not our own anymore. You and I, we live for Jesus. We're supposed to be doing His will. We're supposed to be increasing His kingdom. We're supposed to be bringing Him glory. Peter says you need to get to it. You need to get busy. There are things you should be involved in every single day. Prayer and love and sharing and using your gift. Is that where you and I are? In the midst of that every single day. In Ronald Reagan's first inaugural address, he referenced the simple white grave markers in Arlington Memorial Cemetery. This is what he said. He said, under one such marker lies a young man, Martin Trepto. He left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the famed Rainbow Division. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between battalions while under heavy artillery fire. We are told that on his body was found a diary, and on the flyleaf under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. And these were Martin's words. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure, I will fight cheerfully, and I will do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. As I read that, I realized, at least for me, That reflects the very call that you and I have been given. But we we have been given the very call to do the same thing, to make the same pledge that Martin did. With one big difference. Instead of everything depending on our own strength, everything depends on God's strength. But our pledge should be something similar. 
I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure, I will fight for the kingdom of God as if everything depends on me, but knowing that everything depends on the Lord. Every day, every moment, I will fight, I will work, I will sacrifice. Peter addresses one last period of time in our life. Starting in verse 12, he says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in His suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing His glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name. For the time has come for judgment. And it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God who created you, for He will never fail you. Peter asks us to break free from the past and get focused on the right now. And then at the end of this chapter, he says, but you also need to keep focused on the future. You need to keep focused on the future. You need to understand that God is going to judge. God is going to judge. All people, God is going to judge. You need to keep your eye on that. You need to recognize that. You need to realize that one day everything is going to come to a conclusion. Peter lays it all out there. You will suffer for Christ. But that testifies to your faith. A faith that is worth worth. It, a faith that will bring us through a judgment because we have called upon the name of Christ. How often have we done a disservice to the kingdom by implying that a life of faith is easy? How often have we called someone forward and said, hey, if you give your life to the Lord, all things will just turn into beds of roses. A life of faith can be very very hard a life of faith can be very very hard but it's eternally worth it second corinthians chapter 4 verse 18 paul says so we don't look at the troubles we can see now rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen for the things we see now will soon be gone but the things we cannot see will last forever let's just be real honest if you come to christ there is a temporary cost that will bring about an eternal reward. If you come to Christ, you may suffer. If you come to Christ, you may be imprisoned at some point. Depending on where you live in this world, that's a very uh, uh, good possibility. If you come to Christ, there's a cost to be paid. But there's an eternal reward to be gained. So don't lose sight of what is coming How often have we given in to the temporary only to find out just how temporary those pleasures really are? How often? How often have we given up because of suffering only to realize just how much we wish we would have pushed through and continued on our journey? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, It says, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. God is calling on us to redeem the time that He has given us. God is calling on us to take those 86,400 seconds every single day and redeem that time to use it for Him. And the only way we can do that is if we will break free from the past and get busy on the now with the realization of what's to come. Not just for us, but for all people. 
Because when judgment comes, those people who have not accepted Christ, they have no hope. We are their hope. Who have we told? Who have we shared the message with? Who have we called out to? Imagine yourself at the end of your life being welcomed into the very presence of Jesus who saved you by His grace. And in the midst of all the wonderful things that you're experiencing, you're ushered into your own media room. As you enter your own personal media room, you're told that you get to sit there on a cozy couch with comfortable pillows, eating as much popcorn and candy as you want because in heaven, they don't have calories. (laughs) And while you sit on that couch eating that popcorn, you're going to watch a video of your life. Now the video is a uh, uh, compilation of all the moments in your life when you were fully present with God. All the moments when you weren't numbed out or distracted by media and technology, TV, the internet, the cell phone, Facebook, and on and on we can go. All the moments when you were totally engaged with others or fully attentive with God. Now imagine this video playing in front of you in your personal media room and ask yourself, How long would my video be? How long would my video be of me being engaged with God or engaged with others? How many scenes would depict me relishing in a life that is full of God? How many scenes would show me completely ready to hear what Jesus is trying to say to me? This morning, Jesus is saying something to us. Today, our text is saying something to us. Saying that we need to be completely present in the now with God. Which means we need to break free from our past and our guilt. And we need to keep our eyes on the future. And, And we need to do what God is calling us to do in this moment. Today. Is that the description of your life? Someone who is engaged with God every single moment of every single day? Or are you distracted by all sorts of things that life keeps throwing at us? I heard just this week they were talking about screens. Any kind of screen. It doesn't matter. They said that those screens are as addictive to children as crack. And we keep throwing them right in front of them. Here, watch the screen. Watch the screen. They're crying. Watch the screen. How am I spending my 86,400 seconds each and every day? How are you spending them? Paul says, Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. 